Is it really fireproof? Crash proof? Weather proof? Can it stand up to a sledgehammer? A ton of dynamite? Nothing passes onto the market without first being crash tested. In the world of crash testing, nothing gets smashed, flipped, skidded and generally demolished as much as cars. Governments, insurance companies, consumer groups and car manufacturers destroy literally thousands of new vehicles each year in a spectacular variety of ways. Government-mandated front, side and rear impact tests are just the start. Car manufacturers have staged and tested an astonishing range of accident scenarios. In this test by Volvo, a car was actually driven off a second-story roof. Cameras inside the vehicle recorded the plunge from the driver's point of view. As well as crash testing, cars are subjected to a medley of performance tests along grueling roads, through water, and across snow and ice. The history of this kind of rigorous testing dates back to the early days of the auto industry. In 1924, General Motors began developing their 4,000 acre testing ground north of Detroit. The site they were looking for needed to have both water on the facility to do some water uh, intrusion testing, plus it needed areas where we could construct straightaways, hill climbs, and uh, the site here in Milford had enough difference in elevation that we could basically construct any type of a road that a consumer might encounter in a real world driving situation. And some that a driver would never encounter. We had uh, people pouring water on the tire as we went around in a circle to measure turning radius. We also had some large pendulums that we would pull cars onto, and by measuring the timing of the pendulum, we could determine the center of gravity of the vehicle. We did rollover testing of vehicles where we had an elevated ramp and we pull the car up the elevated ramp and let it roll over a hill to measure structural integrity of the vehicle. We've got footage of crash testing where the operator would stand on the running boards and put a brick on the accelerator and just before he hit the wall he jumped into the arms of a couple waiting fellows who caught him while the car turned into the wall. The largest crash testing facility in Europe is located to the west of London. Here at the Transport Research Laboratory, we investigate all aspects of transport, and in particular, transport safety. Looking at accidents to try to find out where the problems are, and then trying to come up with solutions to overcome those problems. Safety issues came to the fore in the 1960s with the arrival of faster, deadlier cars. Manufacturers now had to assess their vehicles in a much wider range of tests. We identify problems on the road by carrying out accident investigation. That's the real indicator of what's happening. But of course, we then have to reproduce those on the track, perhaps carrying out car-to-car -car crash tests. From that, we try to identify the most important characteristics that influence the outcome of the accident and to develop a simpler crash test, which then could be used for legislation or for other test procedures to develop cars. Crash testers used simply to drive a car head-on straight into an obstruction. But it was soon realized that this did not correspond to what happens in real accidents. Initially, 
The crash tests we carried out were a full width impact that simulated cars, the whole of the front of the car hitting the whole of the other car. Maybe because car drivers try to avoid the impact, what we should actually find on the road is that most cars are about half overlap. And so the problems for the car is that in that sort of an impact, only half of the car's structure is available to protect you. And so it's important that we take that characteristic into account in doing the tests. So the crash test that we take is a partial overlap impact in order to replicate what's happening most frequently on the road. Crash testers soon found that one device substantially reduced the risk of injury to a car's occupants. Probably the most effective safety feature we've ever had is the seatbelt. All of the things that we do to car structures for frontal impact are just wasted in the event that you don't have a seatbelt system. The idea of having control of a passenger compartment collapse over the deceleration that the car has from the crumple zone is really all wasted if you as an occupant just hit the interior. So really, in every type of impact, you need to be wearing your seatbelt. That enables the safety features that are being incorporated in cars to work. The introduction of anthropomorphic test devices, known as crash test dummies, pushed car crash testing to another level. Crash test dummies were first developed after the Second World War by the Air Force to test ejection seats and pressurized cabins. This pioneering dummy was built in 1946. The earliest crash test dummies were basically those used by the aircraft industry for evaluating ejector seats. They are basically the right mass distribution for a human with the right movements of the joints and they were used to test the strength of restraint systems rather than to looking at injury risk in accidents. The next generation of crash test dummies, modelled on the human skeleton, were increasingly able to replicate the biomechanics of people. Dummies were becoming more and more sophisticated as we learn more and more about how the human behaves and how the human is injured in crashes. Today's dummies are designed with much more capability of measuring the reaction of the crash on the human themselves. The chest moves, there's an accelerometer measuring the acceleration of the head for instance. They tell us much more about the injury risk under different crash conditions so that we can measure whether safety devices have given us a significant improvement. They can also give us some measure of the injury risk when we crash test cars. Three, two, one. The biofidelity of dummies is so crucial to safety testing that the dummies themselves must be tested with a 50 pound weight propelled at 15 miles per hour. Three, two, Instrumentation was the other major breakthrough in CTD development. Contemporary dummies are packed from head to toe with as many as a hundred sensors. This is the, the latest development of frontal crash test dummy. Uh, it's developed in the United States and with a lot of input from research from, from the United Kingdom and the rest of Europe. Uh, what is particular about this dummy is that there's measurements of force in the facial area so that we can measure the reaction if the head hits the steering wheel. The chest and uh, shoulder is much more uh, human-like in its response. There are more sensors inside the chest to measure the deformation in various positions within the chest. We also have sensors in the abdomen in this dummy which measures the amount of force, the amount of deformation. And this dummy has a more sophisticated shoulder uh, and with correct anatomical positioning and movement. Uh, in the chest you can see that the ribs are human-like in their orientation and in their size and we've got the capability of measuring the deformation of the rib cage in four positions, two at the top and two at the bottom. And we can also measure the rate of movement of the chest, both of which are related to injury risk. Uh, and again, we have load measuring on the pelvis to indicate the forces generated there as well. But these dummies don't come cheap. 
At $100,000 each, it's hardly surprising that at General Motors they have a dummy hospital where crash test dummies are patched up after each crash and prepared for their next accident. In contrast to the freewheeling crash tests of the early days, today's tests are prepared with extraordinary sophistication. Sensors monitor as many as 200 points of impact, and each one is wired up to record and analyze that information. Between 20 and 30 cameras document the test from every angle. Crash testing is particularly vital when the car being tested is a one-of-a-kind prototype which has to pass a safety assessment before it can be approved for mass production. The prototype alone can cost over a million dollars. But the latest tests go beyond simply defining the laws that govern a vehicle's manufacture. Legislation provides a minimum requirement that all cars must meet if they're going to be sold on the road. What it doesn't do is it doesn't provide an incentive for car manufacturers to make their cars safer and safer over time. Consumer information programs provide that. In Europe we have the European New Car Assessment Program, the Euro NCAP, where cars are crash tested, the information from those crash tests is published. The Euro NCAP system calls for new tests to establish a European-wide five-star safety rating. Well, we found that uh, although accidents uh, vary from country to country, about a quarter of all the serious accidents with death or injuries are from side impact. And in some places, for example, in Germany, uh, that half of those come from an impact against a vertical rigid object, such as a tree or a lamppost. The pole test is the new test designed to measure a car's safety level in a side impact. The test involves propelling the car at 18 miles an hour into a rigid vertical object and then measuring the effect on the dummy in the car. And we discovered that if there was no special precaution inside the car, the head injury criteria, as it's called, on the dummy can go as high as 5,000, which is five times the level at which you would expect the injury to be fatal. Whereas if a specially fitted airbag at the right height on the car is there, then that can go down to as low as 100 to 300, which is easily survivable. The public can use that information in making their uh, decisions about buying new cars. Car manufacturers who want to make their cars safer can get a reward because they get better scores, they see that, and it affects their market share. And so there is the incentive for car manufacturers to make their cars better and better over time. If crash testing cars is a complex operation, it's nothing by comparison to crash testing aircraft. Especially when the crash test doesn't go as planned. Are subjected to a variety of tests. The US military has been crashing planes since the 1920s. This twin prop was pushed down a long ramp and into a wall to pinpoint when and how it would burst into flames. High speed cameras enabled researchers to study the fireball, which ignited exactly three fifths of a second after impact. It wasn't until the late 1950s, when aeroplanes and jets became a more widespread form of travel, that crash testing became standard procedure. One early test involved this four-propeller super constellation, which was smashed into a hillside in the Arizona desert in 1964. In the United States, it is rare to crash test a plane from the air. The one exception occurred in 1984, when a remote-controlled four-engine Boeing 720 took off from an Air Force base in California's Mojave Desert. The 
is the only time that we remotely flew an aircraft. It is extremely, extremely difficult to do that. Uh, the expense certainly is one thing. The complications of just the safety issues alone. We had to be sure that if something went wrong with that remote control operation, that we literally could explode that aircraft over the desert, not over populated areas. This exceptional test took four years of preparation and cost $12 million. Over 90 crash test dummies were strapped into the aircraft. An incredible 300 film cameras were positioned to record the event, some of them on the fuselage itself. The test was conducted to assess the effectiveness of a fuel additive, thought to prevent planes from becoming fireballs when they crash. Fireballs erupt when a plane's fuel tanks are ripped open so violently that the fuel whips out in a mist which ignites on contact with flame. An anti-misting formula called AMK had been successful in a series of small-scale tests. Now the American authorities wanted to test it on a full-blown crash before ordering the US airline industry to include the additive in all aviation fuel. But this was no ordinary test. The jet had to be crashed in a manner that would make the fuel spew and mist. Crash engineers placed eight wing opening devices at precise points on the crash path of the plane. These were designed to slash the wing fuel tanks and trigger the mist. To ensure the mist had a chance to ignite, kerosene jets were placed in the tail of the plane and set to fire for nine seconds after the crash. To facilitate ignition, 12 high-intensity light towers directly in the impact zone and a landing bed made of broken rock designed to vibrate the plane violently were added. But as it turned out, ignition was the least of their worries. The remote control craft hit the ground at an unplanned angle, just enough off-target to rip into the fuel supply in a way that did not create any mist, but did send a geyser of fuel into a burning engine. This created the opposite of what was planned, a spectacular fireball. Frankly, it, it did not go as well as we had predicted. The attitude of that plane was not typical of a landing. Had a pilot been on board for a, for a normal landing at an airport, the plane would have gone around. He would have you know, applied power and gone around a second time and made the landing. Because of the way the fuel came out of the tanks, most of it not misting, but simply literally pouring out as a fuel, pouring on an engine that was on fire, uh, it, it didn't even have the opportunity to demonstrate its capability to prevent misting. We could not prove the concept that AMK worked. Although the AMK part of the test went badly wrong, and the additive was never recommended, the test was successful in other ways. The cameras and dummies in the cockpit and passenger section gave analysts a realistic sense of conditions inside a plane when it crash lands and goes up in flames. Important safety data was gathered from the test. The behavior of overhead compartments, seat structures, hazardous materials containers and other components. The instrumented dummies provided information on the stress loads a person would experience in a crash. We can measure the forces from the impact starting at the ground level through the frame of an aircraft, through the seat of an aircraft, and into the individual itself. So you don't want people incapacitated that they can't get out of the aircraft. The question is, what are those forces? How strong should the seats be in order to protect the human and in case of an accident. Although the American authorities have yet to attempt another air-to-ground crash, such crashes can be simulated by combining data from two other kinds of tests. Vertical drop testing is where a fully mocked-up passenger section of a plane is dropped from 12 feet. And horizontal ground testing rams the same section into a concrete wall. If you add those two vectors together, they are simulating what would occur in an aircraft that might impact the ground at, let's say, 120 knots landing. The, for, the, the actual forces on the body would be those two vectors put together. In the United States, 
fire testing on aircraft is also carried out. And as part of its terrorism defense program, the occasional plane is blown up. The American Department of Defense has been conducting vulnerability and lethality tests on its fleet since the Second World War. This entire field is filled with helicopters and planes that have been or will be blown up and destroyed. I had the seventh largest air force in the world <laughs> at one time. We currently have on inventory here at uh, Air Base Range 6 a variety of helicopters and fixed wing aircraft. These aircraft have been brought here to be destroyed. When it comes to destruction, no plane has ever been more totally demolished in a crash test than this F-4 Phantom. Sent hurtling along a 2,000 foot track at 480 miles an hour, the 43,000 pound plane plowed into a million pound 12 foot thick concrete wall, leaving behind nothing but dust and rubble. The test, commissioned by the Japanese, was designed to see if the concrete casing that houses nuclear power plants could stand up to a direct hit by a falling jet. Although the jet disintegrated, damage to the concrete wall was minor. But not all crash tests take place on the road or in the sky. Saints, strong boxes... This living room was burned to demonstrate how quickly a dry Christmas tree can burn out of control. Many of the most dramatic and elaborate fires caused are to study a deadly phenomenon called flashover. Flashover is a kind of ignition point when gases and temperatures become so hot that everything within the immediate environment ignites at the same moment. In some of the videos you can see flashover in the case of uh, the living room where a modest ignition source, a, an electric match, uh, ignites a sofa and you see the flashover occur as the hot upper gas layer builds and that ignites and the flames come out of the doorway of the room. And within three minutes and 10 seconds, three minutes, 15 seconds, we see that room going from a room that you could escape from to be a room where anyone in that room would die. There was a survey taken a number of years ago, and a large number of people felt that after the smoke detector activated, they would have 10 to 15 minutes to get out of their house. And many times we find that we have a flashover anywhere from two to four minutes uh, after the smoke detector has activated uh, with most residential furnishings. So people really don't have that much time. Other American consumer companies are also conducting tests on cigarettes children's pajamas and party toys like this highly flammable cake decoration that was recalled in 1999. In this 1978 fire test, nuclear waste containers were heated for 90 minutes at 1400 degrees to see if they would melt or leak. They didn't, but just to make sure, they were dropped from 30 feet. Smashed into a 690-ton concrete block at 84 miles an hour and rammed with a train. The containers emerged unscathed. victorious in World War II must still fight the greatest civilian hazard of all, fire. Underwriters Laboratories has been testing on a large scale for over 50 years, putting everything from glass partitions to roofing shingles fanned by a 12 mile per hour wind through trial by fire. Over the years, countless extinguishers have been tested 
and numerous new testing techniques have been pioneered. In this 1940s test, a sprinkler system was triggered, then measured on a partition floor to see exactly how much water it delivered throughout the room. Today, the laboratories have the world's largest indoor fire testing facility, a mammoth adjustable furnace the size of a convention hall, built in 1996. It measures 120 feet by 120 feet by 55 feet tall. It has a large movable ceiling, which measures 100 feet by 100 feet, weighs 200 tons. It's the world's largest land-based elevator. But here's where we do the very large warehouse simulations. If we want to simulate a, a hyper store with flammable liquids stocked 30 feet in the air, we can do that. Whiskey barrels filled with whiskey. We could pull in a mobile home fully furnished and test it in here. The fire testing compound consists of 30 state-of-the-art testing chambers. In this chamber, a fire has been lit to test a new foam suppressant. The foam, which is still in the development stage, must douse the flame in seconds to earn the safety seal. It fails and it has to give way to a stronger extinguisher, which puts out the fire. In another chamber, boxes of plastic cups have been assembled. And we're going to burn that, just a small ray as we call it here. And we're going to see how much fire suppression is needed, how much water is required to, to suppress that fire with that commodity. And that's just a small scale fire. Many of the fires that we run here are 50 fold of what you're seeing in this small scale example here. Like this exploding heap of aerosol paint cans. It's not just consumer and manufacturing associations that have to test. The American military make it a priority. Department of Defense tests a huge range of weapons and equipment. Every piece of artillery, even handguns, every vehicle has to operate smoothly in the toughest conditions that war can provide. We cannot afford in this business of warfare to have a battlefield recall. In those conditions, someone would be injured or die. So the key to testing is to give that independent look, that uh, quality look, to see that the equipment will meet the challenge of the battlefield. So we have developed many procedures that duplicate the stress that you would see in a battlefield without having to uh, actually be in the combat zone. The U.S. Army has testing facilities all around the country. The oldest and one of the biggest is in Aberdeen, Maryland. Created in 1917, when the army needed room to test tanks and planes for use during the First World War, this 76,000 acre spread has felt the impact of tens of thousands of shells and 24 million pounds of bombs. During the Second World War, Aberdeen was the busiest proving ground in the world. Virtually every weapon of the war was tested here including tank flotation devices that were used for the D-Day landings, and a 280mm automatic cannon capable of ground firing an atom bomb. That was about the biggest thing that we tested here, yes, and we actually did proof firing on the, on the weapon itself. We, of course, never did fire an atomic round. You could fire a, an inner round uh, without any trouble at all and stay within the boundaries of our capabilities and uh, we did fire a number of rounds. World War II tanks, jeeps and other vehicles were also thoroughly tested. Well right now we're at the uh Munson test area, one of three primary automotive test courses that we have here at Aberdeen Proving Ground. 
and uh, this particular area is about 150 acres, and there's about 25 discrete obstacles or road courses here to determine the characteristics, uh, physical characteristics, dimensions, and capability of the vehicles. We'll be seeing a uh, truck going over what's called our frame twister course, which is a, uh, a series of sine waves. And uh, the purpose of that is to take a look at the structural strength of the frames on vehicles and the welds that hold the, all the frame rails together. And also to check out the suspensions and their ability to stay on the ground and keep that vehicle moving along. The work we do on our washboard courses here that includes the 6 inch and there's a 2 inch washboard and a 3 inch space bump. Uh, they're largely instrumented tests where we add accelerometers to see the input to the sophisticated equipment on board. We do want to protect it from severe vibration and shock. These armored vehicles were filmed during lethality and penetration tests. The impact of a shell's direct hit is fully recorded. Concern is in lethality and armor testing is the killing power of the threat weapon. Does it give a crew kill? Does it give a vehicle kill? One of the biggest dangers inside a vehicle, if it's perforated, is the fragments. So we use mannequins just to catch fragments. They're fully suited, just as a soldier would be. Obviously, if you're in the zone of the round, as a person, you're going to die. But the question is, can the rest of the crew survive and get that vehicle out of harm's way? Aberdeen is also the site of an underwater munitions testing ground, contained in an artificially created super pond. When the pond was dug out in 1996, engineers found over 450 live bombs dropped during Second World War testing. The Navy uses this site to shock test battleships. That is, to see how electrical and other sensitive systems react to a powerful explosion at close quarters. One of the underwater blasts used to test this minesweeper registered 3.2 on the Richter scale. In July 1997, the U.S. Navy used this superbond to test whether a wall of water could knock a missile off course. You use a water curtain to defeat an incoming munition. We actually had charges in the pond that would produce a curtain when an incoming missile was coming in. And the idea was to make that missile either miss or detonate on the water. A defensive maneuver that's quite interesting if it could work for the Navy, because obviously they have a lot of water. The curtain theory did work, and the Navy is continuing to explore this method of missile defense. All military hardware must be weather tested to ensure it can fight 44 because of problems American pilots were experiencing in the icy war center. But the future lies not with these dummies, but in computer simulations, creating virtual accidents. We now have computer simulations of car crashes, and we have simulations of the dummy as well, uh, which we can put into the simulation from, uh, to assess it on a, a mathematical model basis. Better than that, we can now have simulations of real humans in car crashes. Whatever new products and technology the 21st century brings, one thing is certain. Crash testing will continue to explode and expand.